Namaste everyone. I pray to the divinity in you. Today we are doing the very last chapter of the Tripura Rahasya and this is our last session on the detailed commentary of the Tripura Rahasya. In our last session we discussed the different types of jhanis that is the state of a jivan mukt in this last session we will elaborate on the three stages of the jhani as well as summarize the entire teachings of the tripura rahasya i am reading from verse 43 Chapter twenty two of the Tripura Rasya. The lowest level of Jani have realized the self, and have also understood the unreality of the external world, but they lack sufficient practice, and identify their bodies with the self, because their knowledge is clouded by the impurities of their past karmas. That is why, on and off. they think the world is real then again knowledge comes forward and dispels the darkness of ignorance thus samskaras and knowledge mingle and make them reap the fruits of past actions o brahman knowledge mingled to bits samskaras as quite different fruits and they are not equally effective desire for knowledge is good therefore it makes one aware of the desire for those obstacles sorry for those objects that create obstacles these obstacles cannot obstruct the desire for attaining truth under the influence of false desire the seeker forgets the desire for truth that false desire can be renounced with firm determination and then he attain, gains a pure desire to attain truth after this that powerful desire for obtaining truth never becomes an obstacle so we see in this elaboration of the lowest level of jani that they have gaps in the knowledge the knowledge is not flowing continuously every now and then they fall into the ignorance of their samskaras these come forward and create something like a darkness imagine you enter a dark room at night you switch on the light you switch off the light you switch on the light you switch off the light so sometimes you can see clearly but sometimes you cannot or it is a bit like having glasses and you can read with your glasses everything very clearly but if you remove your glasses it's all very vague and and there's just no clear letters but they all little squiggles and it's all very hazy and so this is the state of the lowest jani at times he sees everything very clearly because the samskaras are not obstructing his view of the truth and he sees the world as it is he does not see it through the filter of the samskaras but then the samskaras become active again and he loses that witness like quality so this level of jani has to go through the bhoga the experiences which are connected with those samskaras but they are not quite the same as what an ignorant person experiences because there is also a desire for knowledge mingled with the desire for these experiences so samskaras are mixed the desire for truth and knowledge coexists with the desire for worldly experience while the desire for knowledge is good 
the desire for worldly objects can create obstacles. But these obstacles that are created are not that strong. But under the influence of these obstacles or these false desires, as it is called here in this translation, the seeker forgets the desire for truth. This level of journey, he goes from having a strong desire for truth and then falling into the desire for worldly experience. But when this desire for worldly experience, this false desire is renounced, this sankalp with firm determination, this powerful desire for truth is now very strong because there are no obstacles and that leads to the highest attainment. From verse 50 onwards, we understand now in greater detail the level of the second jnani, the second um, level jnani. I am reading from verse 50. In the case of a second level jnani, the truth is never forgotten and false knowledge vanishes. He performs his actions in the world while maintaining his awareness. This state is a state of the second level of adept. Now I will tell you about the seekers. When a seeker starts treading the path of Atman, his awareness begins to strengthen. When this awareness is completely strengthened, he can never forget his true nature. Without firm determination, the false appearance of duality cannot be removed. O Brahman, seen from the standpoint of a completely realized one, there is no difference between Samadhi and the activities of the world. One who has attained Samadhi is always aware of the truth. The second level of aspirant who has attained samadhi, is sometimes not aware of his true self. When he encounters false knowledge, he becomes weaker. But one who is of the highest level of journeys remains tranquil at all times because his awareness is firmly established even when he is not in samadhi. O Brahman, listen. Actually, for both the middle and the highest level jhanis, the effects of the karmas are not very significant because these jhanis have attained perfection. They see nothing except the self. When all their karmas are burned by the fire of knowledge, then no karma remains to be performed. Like magician, the things they do are just shows put on for the sake of others. O Brahmin, I'm going to briefly tell you the secret. So, before this wonderful scripture, the Queen of Scriptures reveals the final secret, I would just like to elaborate on what was said here. These verses spoke about the second and third level of journeys, and we have now understood that these two levels, the second and final, the first highest level of jhanis, do not really experience karma and the bondage of karma as an ignorant person does and not even as the jhani at the, the lowest level. Both of these um, levels of jhanis have had the direct experience of samadhi. In the case of the second level, his determination is so strong, he cannot forget his true nature and he sees no difference between samadhi and the activities of the world. 
he sometimes forgets himself he becomes weaker but he does not experience the bondage of karma at the highest level he remains tranquil at all times even when he's not established in samadhi and he is in the midst of the world in worldly activities he is still firmly established in his state of continuous conscious awareness and they perform their actions just like it's like a show they do things because well, what else should they do they have to do something so that's the attitude we just do it because we have to do it and they do not have really the kind of attachment to the fruit of the karma that most of us have so if they have to do a job they just do it this does not mean that they're not interested this is not the same as this indifference or this disinterest which can be negative tamasic quality it is a sattvic quality it is vibrant it is full of compassion it's full of love it's full of awareness and this is very different from somebody who is full of sloth who is tamasic who is dull and he says oh i'm not interested in doing anything well this is a careless approach and this is not what is meant here very often beginners on this path misunderstand this and they think oh i'm supposed to be disinterested i'm supposed to be indifferent to everything so they don't want to show emotions even if they feel them because they are playing jani this is not something you just play it is a direct experience and when you are established in this witness like quality and witnessing everything then you will be like an actor and this just happens spontaneously then becomes effortless it's quite different from a beginner on this path pretending to be a jani but who ends up just suppressing his emotions pretending to be indifferent or he ends up in sloth in laziness and darkness and dullness and cause that lack of interest spirituality so these are the pitfalls of reading such advanced texts which describe the state of the highest ones of the adepts so now you must be waiting anxiously to hear the secret finally the tripura rahasya reveals the rahasya or the secret this is the adhi rahasya the secret of secrets and so verse 59 says o brahman i am going to briefly tell you the secret the highest level jani is awareness is like the awareness of shiva there is no difference at all this is the truth i will repeat this once again o brahman i am going to briefly tell you the secret the highest level jani is awareness is like the awareness of shiva there is no difference at all this is the truth we are not talking about a deity called shiva we are talking about shiva shakti shiva here is pure consciousness the witness the highest state of awareness turiya it's not really a state it is just pure awareness and this is the truth so here it is said by the scripture this is the secret to some 
this may come as a disappointment. They will say, oh, it's just about awareness. I thought there was something more interesting to this. Well, for those who have had even a moment of pure consciousness, this direct experience will completely transform your life. So you know that this is not just something ordinary, simplistic, just said here in a sentence. It's a very powerful line. And when a seeker can attain this, can maintain this level of awareness at all times, is established in it, he's an adept. And such a person can truly enjoy life. And he becomes not only an architect or master of his own destiny, he becomes a guardian of humanity. He can help others to transform and come out of their misery. Verse 60 Therefore, all the karmas of the highest level jhanis are exhausted. After Prince Hemangada's explanation, the Brahmin's doubt was dispelled. He was illuminated within. He went to his kingdom happily. After this, both the princes returned to their capital. So finally, this story that was told by Dathatreya to Parshurama has ended. This was the story about the young enlightened prince who was conversing with the Brahmin ghost who then was freed from his curse and asked further questions and has now resolved all his doubts. And that, that story ends. So many such stories have been told to explain things to the students to keep their interests alive. It's an ancient Indian tradition to transfer knowledge through stories. This is interesting not only for adults but also naturally for children. And this is in fact not restricted to Indian tradition, but all religious and spiritual traditions throughout the world. There were always stories told, and these stories were easy to hand down and to spread the teachings. In those days, there were no printed books. It was very difficult to handwrite books, copy them, and... Um, such books were very precious and very expensive. Not everybody could afford that. And most people were also illiterate at that time. Only the very wealthy were educated. Mostly those were people of, from nobility, that is uh, princely families, or from the clergy, that is um, those who were either priests or, or monks, these were educated. All others were illiterate. They were not able to read and write. So these stories served as a means of teaching and transmitting knowledge and teachings to people broadly throughout the the society. So, Tathatraya tells the last story to Parshurama in this scripture. I'm reading now from verse 63, from the very last chapter of the Tripura Rasya. 
Parshurama asked the Tatraya, O Gurudev, I heard these wise words from your mouth. My doubts are dispelled, and at last I comprehend the knowledge of the Absolute Reality. All-pervading Atman is seen throughout the universe. O Gurudev, please summarize everything you have told me once more so that I can keep the essence intact in my heart. At his request, Tatatya said, Parshurama, listen, I will give you the essence. This, once again, is very important to understand that the ancients did not really emphasize only learning scriptures by heart. Learning scriptures by heart was a necessity since there were no printed books or very few books that were handwritten and copied. So learning entire scriptures by heart was actually a necessity. It was not something that was required of the student, of a good sincere student. What was required of a good sincere student was to understand the gist of the scripture. And the scriptures themselves say, get the juice of these scriptures, get the juice of it, absorb it, and completely digest it, absorb it, let it become a part of every cell within you. Integrate this in your life so that it becomes an inseparable part of you. This juice is what will transform you. Merely learning by heart will not transform you. So the Brahmins, as I mentioned, were the custodians of ritual knowledge and they were custodians of scriptures. So there was a lineage where these scriptures were learned by heart and handed down from one Brahmin to the next so that these scriptures were not lost. And they were not lost. For thousands of years, this tradition kept that knowledge alive. But this does not mean that those Brahmins had understood this profound wisdom and integrated it. And it had not necessarily become a part of it. So there were very few Brahmins who were also enlightened masters. Most of them were just priests who were custodians of the scriptures and ritual tradition. As a seeker, what this scripture tells you to do is not just learn by heart, but to understand the scripture and to integrate this in such a way that it becomes a part of you, a part of your life. And keep that essence in your heart. And this is not an easy task. But it is possible. So verses 67 onwards, Tatatreya gives us the essence of the entire scripture. So now the entire scripture is being summarized in a couple of pages here. All the teachings are being summarized here. So this is the grand finale, the grand summary of the scripture. The Supreme Mother of the Universe is pure consciousness. Her very being is the experience of pure I amness. Through her power of sovereignty, she lets the impossible become possible and thus allows this universe to appear within herself like images in a mirror. Listen to how she manifests this world. Because of her essential experience of pure I amness, 
Pure consciousness is all-pervading. Then in the beginning, through her power of sovereignty, she allows herself to appear to be twofold. One aspect of her appears as pure eyeness, while the other aspect is devoid of the sense of self and appears as matter. O Parshurama, the external aspect is called matter, and the aspect that appears as eyeness is called Sadashiv. Although the formless, absolute, self-existent, unmanifest, sees that material part as something separate from himself, he still experiences it as the self. He again, through his Svatantra Shakti, willpower, desires to manifest the universe and begins considering of Yakta, the unmanifest, to be his body. I am this, and starts believing it. During this experimentation, Sadashiv becomes Ishwar, that which uses ego as its instrument is called Ishwar. Ishwar, who is in fact the experience of the entire unmanifest world, then becomes threefold. Rudra, the annihilator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Brahma, the creator. There have been numerous Brahmas, Vishnus, and Rudras. That is what providence is. O Parshurama, it is like the image in a mirror. Nothing is real. Pure consciousness is always experiencing her perfect eye awareness. It is immovable because of its ego. It seems as though it moves. O Parshurama, you pervade your whole body and call it I. Beware of your different senses and limbs and actions. Through them you feel you are the doer. Likewise, pure consciousness is the center of pure I amness and experiences the entire manifestation from the highest Sadashiv to the grossest elements. Pure consciousness, which is also the foundation of ego-centered awareness, is seen as the cause of illumination. You cannot experience, taste, smell or touch sense objects while maintaining awareness of pure I. You can experience them only by identifying yourself with the senses. Just so, Sadashiv is identical with Brahma, Rudra and everything down to the material elements. He is aware of his oneness with everything and performs all actions in the universe through his instruments, Brahma, Vishnu and other deities. Just as your nirvikarp state is being, of being is the very foundation of all, O Parshurama, that real perfect one is neither doer nor knower. Likewise, Supreme Consciousness, although the source of all, knows no duality and initiates no activity, the entire illusory universe appears in her. Through her supreme power, or she seems to appear like the images in a mirror. Therefore, the universe is no more different from her than a reflection from a mirror. You and I and all perceivers are actually pure consciousness, as long as we do not identify ourselves with external objects. A mirror with many reflecting images appears to have many sections, but when all objects are removed, the reflections disappear, then the mirror alone remains. Likewise, after the appearance of duality is removed, pure consciousness alone remains. Just as an image is seen in a jar of water, similarly an image is seen in the mirror of pure consciousness. That state of freedom is pure consciousness, the absolute state. There is no sorrow in it. Therefore, it is full of everlasting bliss. Because that state is essentially bliss, 
Everyone desires to attain it. The very nature of the self is joy. That is why all individuals long to realize it. Because of the presence of the self in the body, the body is dear to all. Bodily joys are called worldly pleasures. In deep sleep, when one's awareness is not identified with objects, bliss alone is experienced. Consciousness is full of bliss and everyone wants to attain it. The ignorant are not aware of the bliss attained from Atman. They think that happiness can be found in external objects. That is why they consider happiness to be different from the self. As long as one does not realize he is looking into a mirror, the images reflecting on it seem real. At the moment the reflections are removed, one definitely knows the mirror is pure. He also knows that the mirror is unaffected by these reflections. Likewise, Ajani knows that Atman alone exists in everyone and there is nothing beyond it. This universe appears in the self just as the clay pot appears in clay, ornaments in gold and statues in rock. O Parshurama, Whoever claims this universe does not exist is mistaken because the idea that it does not exist cannot be proven through any source of valid knowledge. By the negation of duality and the idea that it does not exist, there is only self-existent consciousness which witnesses both. How can it be proven that the universe does not exist? Just as a city is seen in a mirror, in the same way, the whole universe rests in pure consciousness. This is perfect knowledge because it is not opposed by any opposite concept. Through its power of sovereignty, consciousness seems to exist as the universe, just as the image of a city appears in a mirror. This is the essence of the scriptures. So, in these verses, Tathatreya summarizes. One of the first points he says is that this, everything is manifested by the mother of the universe, the Supreme Being. This is a manifestor. Manifestation is different from the idea of creation. Perhaps the words creation or the idea of creation were made accessible to people because they didn't understand at that time the concept of manifestation. The Indian scriptures do not talk about creation. There's no story of creation because there's manifestation. What is hidden comes forward and it returns again. So the universe, the, the origin, the end, the preservation, the destruction, all this is cyclical in nature. And today this has been put forward as a theory in physics about the origin of the universe as a, um, a, originally the, the egg which then explodes and there's a big bang. You've heard of the big bang theory and the universe expands and then it begins to contract, goes back. And so this idea has already existed in the Indian scriptures since thousands of years that there are kalpas and there are yugas. And so when the universe returns back to the egg, which is called Hiranyagarbha, the golden egg, and then comes forward again, and it starts all over, then again it goes back. Same for us, we come forth from the hidden, the unconscious. We live out our desires and we go back within. So this is the microcosm. And when we talk about it at a universal level, it's the macrocosm. So there's no creation here. There's manifestation. I have heard certain Western um, scholars talking about creation theory 
from Hindu mythology and they refer to the story of the churning of the oceans where the devas and asuras are churning the ocean and there are the wonderful gifts you know the ratnas the gems which come out from the ocean of milk which is a cow there is um, danvantri coming with amrut and uh, there are many different things uh, kalpa um, kamadhenu the wish fulfilling cow all these things Ir- iravat the white elephant that was gifted to indra so they say that this is a um mythology which talks about the creation of the world but the reality is that, that that's not true this mythology is very symbolic and is talking about the different layers of the um reality this is not theory of creation or a mythology explaining creation because in the indian scriptures there is manifestation and not creation there is a difference between the two and what is manifested never dies there is no end it is a cyclical process it goes back to the seed or the egg whatever you like to call it and it comes forth again and this goes on eternally there is no beginning and there is no end so this is one aspect that the summary talks about the other is the fact that this universe is like a mirror so you put all the objects in front of the mirror and they reflect so the universe is like a mirror with all the reflections these these reflections are not true this is not a reality when you remove the objects the mirror is pure i know that no one has seen a mirror without reflection in it <laughs> that makes it uh this this analogy uh this metaphor all the more interesting and fascinating but this is exactly how pure consciousness is it is a mirror without reflection and finally it says that our state is that of joy and we long for this joy and so we seek this joy and also in worldly pleasures in our pleasures of the body bodily joys and in our sleep when the body is asleep the senses are asleep then we experience this bliss and this is what everybody wants to attain and as long as you think that your happiness is coming from the external objects you will never be happy and so this universe is also described as not just as a mirror which reflects objects but also as a pot of clay um it appears out of clay or the ornaments in a gold or the statue in a rock they go back to the origin and uh, and the final uh, point that is mentioned here is that, uh, that you cannot prove a negative so there are people who claim that the universe does not exist and um these are primarily uh, advaitins and uh, is a intellectual discussion and so they argue about it is all an illusion and the approach of the tantric is very practical he says the tantric says you are in this illusion so as long as you are in this illusion this is a reality for you and you will experience you will suffer this is bhoga you will go through it and you have to free yourself from it to have an intellectual discussion saying that this does not exist how shall you prove it because you cannot prove a negative this is just plain logic can anybody prove that there is there are no purple cows in the world who can prove that maybe somewhere there's a purple cow maybe you have never seen one i have never seen one and i don't know anybody who has seen a purple cow other than the purple cow and the milk chocolate 
Some of you may know the Milka chocolate. It's a Swiss German chocolate. It's very famous and uh, its logo is a purple cow. And uh, But has anybody seen a real cow that's purple in color? Can you prove that a purple cow does not exist? You can argue and say, no, there's no such thing as a purple cow. But maybe there's some mutation. Maybe we just haven't seen it. You cannot prove the negative. If you do see a purple cow, you can say, yes, a purple cow exists. But you cannot prove that a purple cow does not exist. So also, the argument, the intellectual discussion of the Advaitins is a fallacious approach. You cannot prove that the universe does not exist. So, the Tatreya has told us the essence of the scriptures and he continues to say in verse 105 onwards, there is no bondage, there is no liberation, there is no aspirant, there is no way of enlightenment. There is only one absolute self-illuminated power of powers. She is seen as ignorance, knowledge, bondage, freedom and the way of freedom. O Parshurama, it is essential to know this. There is nothing else to be known. There is nothing else to be known. In this way, from beginning to end, I have systematically imparted the knowledge of attaining truth to you. After realizing this truth, man never grieves. So what is Dattastreya saying in this last paragraph? You can call this the summary of the summary. There is no bondage, there's no liberation. There's no aspirant, there's no way of enlightenment. There is only one absolute power of powers. And she, Tripura, is seen as ignorance, sometimes she's seen as knowledge, sometimes she's seen as freedom, sometimes as bondage, and sometimes the way towards freedom. And there's nothing else to be known. A word of caution here. We said already that there's a desire for worldly experience and there's a desire for truth. Do not give up the desire for truth when you hear this and it says, oh, there's no bondage and there's no liberation and there's no way of freedom. And then you say to yourself, oh, fine, then I don't need to do any practice. I can just enjoy my life. That would not be a good idea. We need to do our 50% so we can attain the direct experience which leads us to this conclusion. To take the conclusion and make it yours, you usurp this knowledge. It actually does not belong to you. You have usurped this knowledge if you do that. It's like a doctor who reads a book on, a surgeon who reads a book on anatomy. He reads it from beginning to end and now he says, I'm a surgeon. Is he a surgeon? No. He has never practiced any surgery. He has never done surgery. Just reading a book does not make him a surgeon. So, having read this, if you say, okay, I have attained what is to be attained, there's nothing to be done and I can just enjoy my life, that would be very unfortunate. So, these scriptures were earlier not imparted to anybody except those who were in the lineage and who had been initiated and taken step by step to this direct realization and naturally arrived at this conclusion. It is called Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam. It means do not impart, do not impart, do not impart. 
This knowledge was kept secret for a reason. This is the reason that this can be misunderstood, misused. And reading higher wisdom and making it yours, usurping this, making it yours and claiming now that you are wise is simply not the right way. And so this was kept secret. This, these scriptures were kept secret. Now these scriptures are all available in printed books. They're available as PDFs on the websites. They're available on YouTube, including this commentary. And um, we should treat these with great respect and not try to usurp this knowledge but be inspired by it to find a teacher who is in a lineage and who has learned this from his or her teacher in an unbroken lineage so that you can make these teachings a part of your life. Integrate the juice, hold this essence in your heart and let this joy spread to everyone in the world so that you can become a guardian of humanity and can make a difference. So Dattatreya says his final words, 107, verse 107 says, In this way, from beginning to end, I have systematically imparted the knowledge of attaining truth to you. After realizing this truth, man never grieves. Having received the profound knowledge, if a man does not become tranquil, he is like a statue made of stone, and there is no possibility for him to attain knowledge. By hearing this once, knowledge is strengthened. But those who are not very sharp, how will they grasp it, even by listening to it two or three times? This scripture gives one freedom from all sins and leads to a state of tranquility. It is a source of knowledge. It removes all impurities. It purifies the mind. If it is contemplated upon, it gives freedom from the bondage of ignorance. If one contemplates that which is the self-existent Atman, with a purified mind, he attains moksha. Otherwise, it is all bondage. That bestower of knowledge is called Tripura. Thus, chapter 22 ends happily with a summary of the entire scripture of Tripura Rahasya. With that, we have completed our detailed commentary on the Tripura Rahasya. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope I was able to be of service to you. I pray to the divinity in you. Thank you.